I'm a marine biogeochemist. I study seagrass beds and kelp forest ecosystems. But today I won't be talking to you about biogeochemistry. I'm gonna to speak to you about mapping giant kelp forests in Monterey Bay. You may be familiar with these habitats. Macrocystis pyrifera, or giant kelp, is found all along the California coast. And you may have gone diving in this environment or seen it somewhere like the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which has a beautiful exhibit. You may also have experienced it in the recent Pixar film, Finding Dory. This environment is very important for us to study because it's critical habitat here on the coast of California. And then we think it also might provide a role in buffering against ocean acidification stress in its local environment. So that's something I study on the biogeochemistry side and something that actually got me interested in mapping where these kelp forests are and where they have been historically and then where or how they're changing over time moving forward. So the objective of the study I'm gonna share with you today is to quantify monthly kelp canopy extent at Hopkins Marine Station in Southern Monterey Bay. Over the last year and a half, I've been visiting Hopkins Marine Station on an approximately monthly basis to map this ecosystem. And I'm not looking at the underwater biomass, instead I'm looking at the kelp canopy um, surface area from the air, from drones. And so in this video, you're looking at December 2019 kelp coverage. It may seem a little sparse. In the summer months, you'd have more dense coverage, which we'll see in the data. One of the things that inspired me to do this work or to map it in this way was when I started working at Hopkins Marine Station, I explored Google Earth a little bit. And if you look in Google Earth, there's a historical imagery feature. And if you look at Hopkins Marine Station in that feature, there are only six images um, over the past approximately four years, um, going back all the way to October 2016. Um, so there's not a lot of aerial coverage of this area available in Google Earth. However, in these six images, which you can see here, we do see kelp canopy in all of them. So on the eastern side of Cabrillo Point, Cabrillo is where Hopkins Marine Station is located, we see this protected kelp canopy. It's protected from wave exposure. Um, and that's a feature in all of these images. We also see an exposed canopy on the western side of the point. And that is a feature that we only see in the 2016 map. It's not there anymore. And to this day, we don't have a kelp forest there. And we think that this is due to the ocean temperatures warming. In 2016, we had an El Nino event where sea level te or sea temperatures rose, um, combined with urchin grazing or sea urchins that actually eat the kelp. And those are still there. And the other issue that contributes to the fact that we only have these six images is that it's really hard to take aerial images of this area. We have a lot of cloud cover, a lot of fog down in Monterey. If you're there in the summertime, it does not feel like summertime. It looks like this, where we can't see the marine station, we can't see the water, we definitely can't see kelp cover, we only see clouds in these images. And so one way to get around this is to use drones to map that sea surface and map where the kelp is since they can fly under this cloud cover. So in that picture on the left, you see me and my little drone under the clouds. And I'm just using an off the shelf, um, pretty cheap drone, a DJI Phantom Pro 3 to do this mapping with just a regular RGB camera. And each month I do the same series of steps. So first, I plan out my flight. I'm using Drone Deploy to do this flight planning, and it's very straightforward. I choose the area that I want to map in the software. So here you can see I've drawn a polygon around the point. I try not to fly over the marine station itself. Um, and we're trying to capture both that protected area that we saw in those Google Earth images, as well as that exposed side, where we anticipate that kelp might start growing back, or we hope that that kelp forest might come back since it was a historical feature. The next step, and for this we're gonna look at February 27th, my last flights, our next step is to actually capture those images. And doing this requires oftentimes five to six separate drone flights that are limited by the battery life of my drone. And I capture images along those transect lines. So here we've captured over 1,600 total images 
You can see how they're aligned on those, uh, along those transect lines here. They're rotated so that the overlap between each photo is aligned. And ultimately, we end up with this ortho mosaic of that kelp forest environment um, and the offshore environment beyond Point Cabrillo. And here we have uh, those transects on top, so you can see that planned flight area and then the resultant ortho, ortho mosaic. So this is our February 27th image. And we see this really beautiful rendered stitching of our protected kelp forest. Um, they're on the right side of the screen. And actually, if you look closely at that left side of the screen, you'll see that there are individual kelp sporophytes or individual um, kelps there in that exposed area where we didn't think we would see any kelp. But we do see a couple each month. Now for today's talk, we're going to just look at the protected side of the canopy and compare that through time. So now we've limited a mask over that protected canopy. And if I bring in the rest of my flights, you can see everything over the last year and a half, beginning in August of 2018. So here in these images, that green or yellowish um, stuff at the surface, that's our kelp canopy. And we see that it's present in all of these months. Now we do notice that there are some data gaps here. First, in the winter of 2018 and 2019, that was a really, really wet winter. And the drone doesn't like rain. We can't do flights if it's rainy. It's about an hour and a half commute down to Monterey. So we called off some flights and ultimately weren't able to get those months. It happens. Our other issue was in late summer, the black oyster catchers, which are a local species of birds, um, they were nesting. And so we had to avoid disturbing those birds and were unable to capture imagery during those months either. And here in these images, it's kind of difficult to identify how much kelp is in each and to compare over time. So instead, we classify kelp. Um, and so I've used a classification to identify kelp as the yellow in each of these images. And so here we really see the differences in spatial extent over time. So in the summer months, in the top left where we have August, and in that middle panel, we see really dense cover. But going into our winter months and in the early spring, we have much less kelp canopy at the surface. And this is because there's less nutrient availability in the area, and we also have less light. Um, and kelp senesces in the winter, it loses its biomass. A clearer way to compare monthly cover is in a bar graph. So here, I've taken the individual pixels identified as kelp in those previous images. Each pixel is eight inches by eight inches, and I've converted to the overall area in meters squared. And you can see, as we move throughout the last um, year and a half, we have elevated kelp cover in the summer months, with the maximum cover in July of 2019. And then in the winter, the kelp cover decreases, and we have our lowest cover seen in November of 2019. So I don't want to limit the rest of the study to only identifying kelp canopy on that protected side. I really want to get at what's happening on the exposed side of the point where we've lost this kelp in the last several years. And it was exciting to me that we are able to see these individual kelps showing up there. Um, if you look closely again in the yellow circles, you can see the kelp that is present on that exposed side. And you can see that when we classify it, it does actually identify those points as kelp. However, we're also identifying things that aren't kelp. Things like foam and um, waves, white caps, those are also showing up as kelp in our current classification scheme. So those are improvements we're making moving forward. I also want to put my results in the context of historical imagery. So this is, again, that October 2016 image from Google Earth, where we see this exposed kelp canopy that's not evident in any of the maps that I've collected since August of 2018. And there are some records that are better than annual resolution, and that's really what I'm looking for, are these records where we might have monthly kelp cover changes to compare to what we're seeing now. And of course, we want to try to continue this project moving forward so that we can identify if this kelp forest starts to come back. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the other people involved in this project and the support I've had, especially from Hopkins Marine Station. And I would love to encourage you to reach out to me with any questions or ideas for this project moving forward. I would love to hear from you.